So I'm Philip Oxhorn. I'm the director of the Institute for the Study of International Development. Myself, along with the, the international program at the Dizzle Tales uh, Faculty of Management Studies, in particular my, 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 my colleague, um, M&A Suragolyu, are very proud to present to you tonight what promises to be a really great talk by ISID's newest professor of practice, Professor Kim Samuel. Now, the reason that we invited Kim to be giving the talk, you'll see that when she starts explaining her work, but the reason that we invited her to be a professor of practice at McGill is that basically two things. One is that she's someone who's been involved in the real world in a variety of ways, including business, philanthropy, the development of multi-stakeholder partnerships, as well as academic research. But beyond that, it's important because her work touches on something that's of paramount importance, even though it's often underestimated in terms of how important it really is. You know, now with the SDGs, the, the new Sustainable Development Goals and the post-millennium development goal world, we're beginning to understand that it's more than just how much money you make that defines poverty, that defines the quality of life, that defines all the things that we really are concerned with when we're concerned about promoting international development. And Kim's work on, why, on, on social connectedness gets to something that's really central to this. It's this idea that we are social beings, this idea that particular now, particularly now in our interconnected world, it's really important that we not be isolated. And in fact, those who are the most isolated for whatever reasons, regardless of their income level, often suffer things that we only can imagine if we take the time to actually think about it. Now, in terms, again, of her background, it's important just to, just to remind you how important she really is. And so Kim has worked with Yale University, Harvard University, and Oxford. It's about time you came home to, to Canada and McGill. She's been, among other things, and she is director of the Samuel Group of Companies. She's the chair of the External Advisory Board of the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy, a founding member of the Global Philanthropist Circle, and a member of the Dean's Council at Harvard Kennedy School, and the list goes on and on and on. So with no further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to Professor Kim Samuel. He said that it was going to be a 20-minute introduction, so that caught me a little off guard, but that was the best short introduction I've ever had. Thank you very much, and it's great to be home in Canada. Sego, bonsoir, good evening. I am deeply honored to be here at McGill tonight, both as a professor of practice and as a speaker. I'd especially like to thank Isid and in particular Dr. Phil Oxhorn and Patrick Brennan for giving me this amazing opportunity and even more than that for believing in me. In many ways this affiliation brings me and my family full circle. In 1855, the year Sir William Dawson began building McGill into what it is today, my ancestors four generations back opened the M and L Samuel Hardware and Metals business in the muddy crossroads of the young city of Toronto. In 1867, the year of Canada's Confederation, my great-grandfather, Sigmund Samuel, was born. In his 73 years of leading the company that still bears my family's name, he witnessed and had a hand in many of the milestones of our progress, from the railway linking the nation for the first time to building the gas street lamps that illuminated the streets of Toronto for the first time. His legacy and that of his grandson, my father, Ernie Samuel, who went on to build the company into an international metals business, was and is grounded in relationships relationships with employees, families, and communities. This still holds true in the business today, which is now chaired by my brother, Mark Samuel, who is a member of the fifth generation, like me. If you look at the scope of my great-grandfather's life, it began 
as the political infrastructure was being built to unite Canada. And his work helped create the physical infrastructure that would further illuminate and unite Canada. Which is why it was so eye-opening for me several years ago to experience a Canada that I hadn't previously known. A Canada that was entirely disconnected. A place where physical infrastructure was lacking and social infrastructure had been fractured and fragmented. I'm speaking about First Nations. About five years ago, I happened to have the opportunity to go on a camping trip. This trip was to Anakawana in the James Bay lowlands of northern Ontario. To get there, you first go to a town called Cochrane. From there, you board a train called the Polar Bear Express. I'm not making this up. This heads further north to Moosonee. And the first thing that struck me was that as we were loading our gear into the boxcar, something else was being loaded in. Caskets. These were First Nations elders going home. On this trip with us was the acclaimed Métis author, Joseph Boyden, who has also contributed a great deal of commentary about mental illness, youth suicide, and violence facing many Indigenous nations throughout Canada. He wrote a powerful piece in Maclean's magazine in 2010 called The Hurting. In his words, the northern reserves of our country are the suicide capitals of the world. I've since seen equally grim places in northern Manitoba and in remote islands off Vancouver Island in British Columbia. Falling down government houses long since separated from the steps that lead up to them. Muddy, rutted paths and roads. No shortage of water mixed with dirt, but shortage of water safe to drink. Food choices so limited that the diet itself almost demands diabetes. Schools staffed with teachers who don't know the communities and where students begin dropping out at age 10. Homelessness, sexual abuse, gangs and violence. We are talking about over 600 scattered communities who are part of over 50 distinct nations, but they share a series of staggering statistics. An Indigenous woman is three times more likely than a non-Indigenous woman to be assaulted or to go missing or be murdered. A child born into an Indigenous community in Canada is twice as likely to die in infancy as one born elsewhere in the country. If that child makes it to her teenage years, she is five times more likely to commit suicide. And if she survives, she is more likely to end up in jail than to graduate from high school. You see all this when you first arrive on a reserve many reserves across Canada, as I have on several occasions. And you think, this feels very far away from the Canada I thought I knew. Now each of these problems ostensibly has a cause and therefore a solution. If a bad diet is the cause of diabetes, let's improve the diet. If addiction and dependency are the cause of violence, Let's treat addiction and dependency. If unemployment is the problem, let's train people to be entrepreneurs. Yep, that'll do it. And yet, intervention after intervention has failed. Because while each of these efforts to help is needed, none of them is sufficient. Even though they are well-intentioned, they are often misdirected. And unless they address a missing piece of the equation, they will not be effective. Now someone might want to jump up and say, I've got it. The missing piece is clearly poverty. 
And poverty is certainly part of the challenge afflicting First Nations communities, as it is for other marginalized and struggling populations around the world. But here as well, there's often an element missing from the conversation. While most governments and policymakers define poverty by income, poor people themselves define it more broadly. And one of the key deprivations they describe is a lack of belonging. I spent two years exploring this as a visiting scholar with the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. I remember a woman in Mozambique who told me that poverty means being lonely and not being able to get things because you are lonely. Another said, even if you are hungry, you can't go to your neighbors to ask for food or money because they are judging you that you are poor. The shame of being seen as in need can be so painful that people withdraw and isolate themselves. And when those human connections are absent or lost, our suffering is profound. We can define isolation as the deprivation of social connectedness. That's what we did at Oxford. But I would also like to add to that definition a visual image, one that inspires me to do something every single day. The feeling of sitting alone at the bottom of a well. A separation so profound and painful that it can occur in the midst of others. A circumstance in which coldness, not the warmth of connection to others, is the defining sensation, and darkness, not light, is the norm. In his book, Becoming Human, the Canadian philosopher, humanitarian, and founder of the global L'Arche movement, Jean Vanier, writes, to be lonely is to feel unwanted and unloved, and therefore unlovable. Loneliness is the taste of death. Human beings are social creatures. We rely on others to help us live and thrive and grow. Isn't that what it's all about? So, as I see it, the missing piece of the equation is social isolation. And when we look at challenges facing First Nations and First Nations peoples, we immediately see the relevance of social isolation in almost every problem. Families and entire communities were affected by state-sponsored policies aimed specifically at breaking the bonds of family and breaking people from their heritage. The legacy of forced assimilation has resulted in what some has described as an eradication of culture, an erosion of traditional values, and a loss of traditional family stability. If you ask indigenous peoples what has caused this crisis, high on their list is the residential school system. The aim as some have chillingly described, was to kill the Indian in the child. We've seen similar policies in other parts of the globe, Australia and South Africa, to cite a couple. And moreover, we see the consequences documented again this week in the New York Times. According to an article, a new study affirms that tragically, and I quote, Native Americans are more likely to be killed by police than any other racial group in the United States. I just want to note that in addition to watching debates and coverage of our federal election next week, I've been watching, as probably a lot of you have, debates and coverage leading way, way ahead of time to the U.S. election in a year. And one of the issues that has been front and center has been the issue of gun control. And I've been thinking a lot lately 
about maybe the focus should also be on who is being shot by those guns, who are the victims of violence and how disproportionate that is, and that very much includes Native Americans. As the article also notes, when it comes to American Indians, mainstream America suffers from willful blindness. As we have all come to learn through efforts of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC in Canada, these schools cut off indigenous peoples from their spirituality, silenced them from speaking their own language, and made sure that children grew up without being able to draw on the indigenous knowledge that covered every aspect of life, from food choices to parenting. And so they become estranged from their elders, their traditions, and their heritage. They also became disconnected from the land by the reserve system that the federal government imposed. And worse still, we now know that these places, built for educational purposes, were also far too often a living nightmare for children. These were places of racism, humiliation, forced labor, confinement, physical and sexual abuse, and even death. In a shocking revelation, the TRC announced in June of this year that while previously undocumented or obscured, they were able to document the deaths of 6,000 children. Put in perspective, a child in a residential school had about a 1 in 25 chance of surviving. A Canadian soldier heading to battle in World War II actually had better chances of returning home alive. All those traumas have been passed down to younger generations. Fractures and disruptive, destructive disputes abound within these communities. They have few jobs and little money, but crucially they have become isolated from themselves, trapped between cultures, seeing no way forward. Once proud nations, thousands of years of self-reliance, thousands of years of internal harmony, thousands of years of harmony with the natural world, now distant and disrupted, a people that are cut off from themselves. Communities that were once vibrant tapestries have been reduced to lonely threads. So the question is not simply, how can we reverse the isolation, nor is it what can we do to fix this? The question is much more about what can we do to better understand and to support. How can we learn and help find the pathways back to building connectedness? Because while being part of a particular group may increase someone's risk of isolation, it need not preordain isolation. Through understanding and supporting one another, we can choose a different path and foster a sense of belonging and community. In my day, the three R's that were really important were reading, writing, and arithmetic. Please ignore for a moment that only one of those actually begins with the letter R. And ask yourself, are these the most essential skills for success in the world today? In part, yes, but only in part. Through learning and listening carefully to indigenous knowledge and wisdom throughout the world, I now see an additional three R's. Three R's essential to building pathways to social connectedness, respect, recognition, and reciprocity. The first key element is respect. To me, respect means first respecting myself, 
From this place, we come to each person with a basic level of acceptance and support. It means I may not always agree with you, but I will honor our differences and I will count on you to do the same things for me. Respect begins with accepting. As Supreme Court Justice Antonio Lemaire famously said, we are all here to stay. That's essentially a way of seeking external respect. And respecting others is vital. But I don't see how you can receive respect from others until you know how to respect yourself, until you see yourself or your community as worthy of respect. I think about all, all the students here tonight, and thank you very much for coming. I think about how hard it must be, even in a great university at McGill, if you don't feel like you fit in, and pretty great when you do. The reemergence we are beginning to see through efforts like the TRC is the first step to creating the foundation of respect. Exactly a year ago, I had the honor of joining with partners, including Special Olympics International, Synergos Institute, and Taking It Global. Together, we convened the first ever global symposium on overcoming isolation and deepening social connectedness. This was a very big moment for me. One of the most powerful presentations came from my friend Jennifer Corriero. Jennifer coordinated a special art contest called Moments of Inclusion, inviting young people to reflect artistically on moments in their lives where they felt included. The call went out across Canada, and we redoubled efforts to directly encourage Indigenous youth to participate. The call was finally picked up in places like Arviat. For those of you who don't know, Arviat is a hamlet in Nunavut. Daniel Kuvianatuk, a young Inuk from Arviat, had a friend who showed him a poster about the contest. Daniel entered and ultimately was chosen to come to Toronto to share his art. I'm really proud to call Daniel my friend. He told me about the way that tapping into his creativity had enriched his sense of self and his connection to his culture and heritage. He said, I am looking at art from a new perspective. It's a way to connect with my inner feelings. And as I learn more, it's changing the way I look at life. Likewise, all of us who saw the exhibit were touched and moved by the personal stories behind each creation, which not only called for respect, but opened us up to offering it too. The second key element is recognition. To me, recognition means I see you for who you are and you see me for who I am. And we need to see each other in order to honor humanity. It means I will look to you to tell me what you need. I will support you wherever you are and you will do these same things for me. As my friend Ovid Mercredi, who previously served as the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations said, it is not so much about finding our place in the world, but the world recognizing the importance and role of First Peoples and cultures to the world. That is recognition. And I fully agree that traditional cultures have valuable lessons to offer society regarding some of the greatest challenges we face. I was struck by a survey by the Vancouver Foundation, which was conducted in 2012 to better understand what community issues the citizens of Vancouver cared about most. To the Foundation's surprise, the most significant issue was a growing sense of isolation and disconnection, the sense that an increasingly individualistic way of life was undermining community caring and engagement. One in four respondents said, 
They were alone more than they wanted to be. Even more troubling, the survey found a correlation between this loneliness and poorer health, lower trust, and a hardening of attitudes toward other community members. I've already noted that isolation can be profound in poor or marginalized societies. Studies like this show that isolation can be felt across demographic, economic, and geographic regions. These new realities in urban Vancouver and in cities across Canada will only be exacerbated by trends such as more people living alone and the aging of many industrialized societies. In the United Kingdom, for example, where roughly 7.7 .7 million people live alone, a recent study found that one in 10 Britons doesn't have a single close friend. And in the United States, a 2010 survey found that 35% of Americans over the age of 45 were lonely. And as with Vancouver's experience, there was a significant correlation between loneliness and poor health. We are looking at a future of increased urbanization and increased ageization. By 2036, one in every four Canadians is projected to be over the age of 65. If those two trends each point to increased isolation and poorer health, what can be done? I believe an approach to this challenge can be found in the architecture of indigenous peoples. My friend, Chief Sean Ainshut Atlio, explains that the central law of his people, the New Chalnath, is Sawak, which means simply, we are one, we are all connected. Chief Atlio recalls listening as a child to the grandmothers of his village sing special songs to the earth, emphasizing the connection between all human activities and natural phenomena. All New Chalnath housing was designed to respect these cultural laws and spirituality, as well as to be appropriate to the climate and local environment. Builders used only the materials they needed. In modern parlance, we'd say they kept their footprint light. But these values of stewardship and harmony with the land were about much more than environmental sustainability. They spoke to a sense of reciprocity and respect for humanity's oneness with all living things. In Africa, this would be called Ubuntu. One of the most important structures was the big house or long house as it is sometimes called, in which multiple families live together with several generations beneath one roof. Made from cedar logs, these long, narrow dwellings were grouped together to form a village. The structure reflected and reinforced the cultural norms of helping and learning from one another. For First Nations peoples, being and belonging were two sides of the same coin. I believe ancient knowledge has a role to play in meeting contemporary challenges. My point is not that we should be constructing longhouses in the hearts of our cities. Rather, in designing our cities, we should embrace the idea of the longhouse in our hearts. The idea that we are really building community where individuals and families can thrive and where people feel connected to each other and to the natural environment. You see, when you spend time in places like a Housit in British Columbia or Missipawistic in northern Manitoba, as I have done, what strikes you first are the challenges and the deficits. But there is something else as well, something very powerful while sometimes frayed or distant, there are threads of connection to community and to place that are beginning to be fully recovered and restored again. These are tremendous assets, 
And if we recognize them as such, we will discover new strategies and solutions that at their core build connection and community. Let me give you just two examples from my times in these communities. First, while at a gathering in a house, it, a community leader excused himself to greet a family across the road. As he returned, he explained that the family was welcoming back a member who had previously been convicted as a violent offender. He said to me, it's difficult, but now it's up to us to help him to find his path back within our community and to support the family too. I was immediately struck by this approach to community healing and to the sense that there was a shared responsibility to reintegrate this individual. What a stark contrast to other approaches that can further isolate and ostracize those seeking rehabilitation. On another occasion in Missipawistic, my eyes were opened to a dramatically different approach to child welfare, one that is grounded in the teachings of elders. Rather than a system where the child is removed, a young woman named Heidi Cook is powerfully making the case that it should be the parent, not the child, who is removed. For the community, this is a reconnection with their way. Caregivers are now brought into the home, and it is the parent who is taken away for counseling, depending on the circumstance. The child stays within the embrace of the community and their connection to home and school as opposed to a foreign environment thousands of miles from home. And as I was mentioning earlier about the residential school system and the legacy that still exists, even with the wonderful efforts and successes of the TRC, we now have truth we still need reconciliation. Think about those children who had no family, no support, no traditional values, and weren't just taken some miles from home, they were often taken clear across the country. Think about that isolation and what, that, what this did, and why for my friend Heidi Cook, what she's doing is so powerful to her community and fills me with hope. Connection to community can often mean the difference between life and death. Right now, an inquiry is underway into the deaths of seven teenagers from remote reserves across the province of Ontario, died while attending schools in Thunder Bay. These programs in urban settings are funded by the federal government with the intention of providing access to secondary school. But too often, they merely repeat the tragic legacy of residential schools by breaking bonds of family and connection to community and to land. We see the same situation occur when young people leave their homes seeking employment and opportunity. The isolation can be profound and overwhelming through listening and recognizing the re-emergence of leadership within these communities. We can construct policy frameworks and programs that at their core build community. And this brings me to the third key element, reciprocity. To me, reciprocity means I live in relationship with you, and you live in relationship with me. It means we only belong if we belong together. It means there is no you and me against each other, or you and me against the world. Everything is mutual, and everything is relative. I also call this belonging. I referenced Jean Vanier a little earlier, and I find the L'Arche model a shining example of reciprocity in every way. 
It's a standard that goes well beyond good care and offers instead relationships of friendship and mutuality, true reciprocity in which each person gives and receives. By contrast, I've always found it a bit ironic that we preach tolerance as a virtue. To me, tolerance can be a form of turning away. You do what you do, and I'll tolerate it. Whatever. I believe that reciprocity is much more positive and powerful because reciprocity demands engagement. And this is the note on which I wish to conclude. I focused much of my talk tonight on First Nations, but my message is broader than that. I believe we need to ask ourselves in every aspect of our life and at the heart of our interactions, have we helped others to overcome social isolation? For those among us who are Canadian, I believe it is in our DNA as a people that has welcomed cultural diversity, multiculturalism, and bilingualism. This is why we were horrified by the revelation that a child lying dead on a beach half a world away might have found refuge here. We know we can do better. Just as my ancestors helped to build the physical infrastructure of Canada, I would like to issue a call tonight for us to build the social infrastructure of Canada through respect, recognition, and reciprocity. I know we can, because just as social isolation is pervasive, so too is it preventable. And so too is connectedness achievable. And in our efforts to solve the problem, we need not work alone. We need each other in this room and beyond. OK, I realize that I'm supposed to be ending my speech now, not beginning a new one. But I do want to say that while I focused on Canada, the issues I've raised here are mirrored in other places and communities around the world. And I know we have students and participants from all walks of life and from all over the world here tonight. And I believe we have a responsibility as Canadians or students in Canada to play a greater role in international development, grounded in our unique experiences and perspectives. I hope this conversation will not only open your eyes to social isolation, but will open your hearts and minds to the ways in which you can help combat it. I think of my family business now heading into the sixth generation and the importance of an emphasis on relationships in order to continue to grow and to succeed. Whether indigenous, multi-generational Canadian, or recent newcomers, we all need to address relationships as individuals, families, and as communities. This really matters. It struck me in conversation with Ovid Mercredi and Sean Atlio, who traced their lineage to this land since time immemorial, that dialogue between our families 150 years in the making is due, overdue even. And I'm so grateful that my own life and work has put me in a position to begin that dialogue. I also want to say that I feel really blessed that I'm getting to make this lecture and share my thoughts with all of you tonight, October 15th, because tomorrow, October 16th, would be my dad's 85th birthday. And I, I can feel him cheering me on. You too can build dialogues that communicate respect, reciprocity, and recognition. Dialogues that begin by listening deeply. Dialogues that lead to reconciliation where reconciliation is required 
and action where action is needed. As we work together, awareness and understanding can overtake fear and isolation. The connections we forge with one another can inspire new opportunities and create a shared sense of humanity and of belonging. And I really look forward to getting input and ideas and thoughts and hopefully involvement from any of you who want to join me. We can do a lot together. As the great Canadian writer Margaret Atwood wrote, we need each other's breathing, warmth. Surviving is the only war we can afford. I can't say it any better than that. Naiwa, merci beaucoup, and thank you very much. So thank you for a, a very provocative and thought-provoking talk. We now have time to begin a dialogue. There's a lot of people, so it's hard to imagine what a dialogue will look like, but it's only the beginning. It's certainly not the end. It's just one step as we begin to work more and more together with Professor Samuels. So anybody who would like to make a short comment or ask a question to react to what you've heard, please come forward to the mics. Please. Yeah, the, the mic is important so that we can record. Hey, how's it going? Hi. <laughs> um, I was just wondering what your company has done concerning your uh, whole speech is on belonging for the Aboriginals of Canada. Okay. Thank you for the question. And could you tell us your name, too? Oh, my name's Phil. Is? Phil. Okay, hi, Phil. I'm Kim. Nice um, to meet you. <laughs> Just introducing one another. Part of I see you and you see me. Uh, Thank you for the question. My answer would be we're just beginning beginning with a very strong awareness and wanting to to build to build community wherever we can in terms of our family foundation which is very much linked to our company and our corporate social responsibility program we've been thank you <laughs> working working um, working very hard to travel and have the honor to travel to different parts of Canada, visit First Nations reserves, and to talk to, to talk to people and to hear their stories. In particular, we have a real interest in getting behind education initiatives. But when I say getting behind education initiatives, I'm referring and we're referring to ones that are created and led by First Nation members and First Nation teachers, indigenous teachers themselves, which I think is something that isn't always done. I can also tell you, and I'm going to ask her to stand, that probably the most important thing that, uh, that we've done in the last year is that uh, the new uh, head, executive director of our family foundation, as well as the senior advisor, to our CSR program is an amazing woman who happens to be indigenous, Jennifer Brennan, and who has a very long history and involvement advocating on, in terms of many issues on behalf of and affecting indigenous Canada. And Jennifer really deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.
Sorry, can I just clear that up? You said you are the fifth generation, uh, and I'm just wondering, has it? Have you had a previous uh, conscious effort into belonging? I guess. Um. Or has this just started from your generation? Well, I I think that call what calling it belonging is really an inspiration that came came to me and uh, as did uh, the idea the idea of making combating social isolation my my passion in in my life including in my in my family business but I also feel that I came came by a lot of a lot of this from my own family history I look back to my great grandfather Sigmund Samuel of, of whom I have only one personal memory at about age three sitting in the lap of a very old man who was reading the wonderful stories that turned out to be Aesop's fables I was later told but in reading his his autobiography which was called in return he writes quite a lot about first first nations and he wrote a lot about the the philosophy also of community and of and of belonging so I, I, I feel that that's come right right through and in, in what I grew up with and my brother and sister grew up with in terms of the values that our families instilled in us but I'm, I'm also also confident that wherever I came from and however I got to this point in life this is what I would be passionate about are you thank you Hello, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, my name is Marie Lemensch. I work at the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. Um, something I've noticed um, is a great lack of um, knowledge among the general public and Canadians and, um, about residential schools, for example. Um, I've seen it uh, you know, at different um, exhibitions and talks that we've held. And what do you think we can do to educate Canadians about this, not only in schools, but also among the general public? And I think we also see it in these elections. Um, it's not been much of an issue. Uh, the NECAB has gotten more attention than mm -hmm. Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. uh, good to meet you, and thank you very much for that question. I wonder about that, too. I, I, wondered, I wonder about it within myself as to why why did I not really get it until I started to visit the reserves in Canada and also to meet First Peoples in, in cities as well? I think it comes down to that word of to tolerance, that sort of, yes, that's part of our, our history. It's almost, it's almost apathy. It's part of our history, and we feel really bad, and yes, that's Canada. It's so hard to believe this happens in Canada, but somehow when we as Canadians are putting on our, our going abroad face, and I, I spent quite a bit of time traveling in other countries, it's very easy to say, and all the things that we're very, very proud about, and I think that we also need to own this too. I think that that kind of awareness is a really good place to start. I also, I also think that the, the healing that's happening, it, it has to, it comes from the, the, in, the inside. It's something that, that over Mercury said that at the symposium that I mentioned a year ago. He said that we don't look, look anymore about how we can influence all of you, referring to those of us from the settler, settler population in the room of which I was one, he said, we, we need to change the way we think about ourselves. I think it's also about things that, that, that I'm really, and I really want to say this, I'm, I'm really at the beginning of the learning curve, and I know that my biggest job is and probably always will be to, to listen and to to not assume that that it's a it's a, this Canada or that Canada, but that what we all want is a shared vis vision in our Canada, 
thinking back a couple of years to something that I had the privilege to go to and be part of the Kanata Dialogues, which was looking at how, which is looking at how indigenous values, traditions, culture, and knowledge permeates Canadian society. And, and I think we can do a lot more in terms of policy, but I think it begins with this simple thing of don't, don't look away, and we have to own it, and we have to call it out and recognize it and, and know that together we can, we, can do, we can do a lot better. And I come back to my three R's. My, my three R's, <laughs> the, hopefully will be other people's three R's <laughs> after tonight, respect, recognition, and reciprocity, and look into indigenous meaning of those words, which, which don't just mean, yeah, I respect you, yep, listen to you, thanks a lot. Now I'll go back to what I'm doing and I'll it, it, tell, tell some people or maybe I'll, I'll think, about, think about this. It's about we, we can't walk in anyone else's shoes, but we can certainly stand with them a lot better. And, uh, and instead, of, instead of being shocked and look away, let's stand there. Let's stand there and honor the wisdom of the First Nations and, and try to do something. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for <clears throat> thank you very much for your um, very provocative yet sentimental talk. Uh, I find it actually pretty mind blowing about how you localize the problem of um, engaging indigenous populations in Canada to the idea of loneliness and isolation. I, I just found that absolutely mind blowing. Well, thank you. Uh, What's your name? I'm Max. I'm Max. Good to meet you. Um, my question is: while uh, meaningful engagement and uh, finding a way to uh, find reciprocity, as you said, uh, sounds like an excellent uh, plan for further engagement and uh, not furthering the politic of kind of just like throwing teachers into, the, into those uh, reserves and throwing resources out of those reserves. But realistically, how do we plan to uh, execute this reciprocity and to actually put in motion, not just say that we're doing things wrong, but yeah. what's a concrete plan for doing these things right? Well, Max, I'd like to hear your views on that too, and everybody's views here, because I think we need to, to get a really, really great dialogue going, and I actually think that your, your generation is, is going to be, be able to really, to really lead this. Maybe I can tell you, to your point, a, a quick uh, vignette of how to do it wrong, and then to illustrate how it could have been done right. I happened to be on one of my one of my trips, and it was uh, to a reserve in in Winnipeg. And on that reserve, there uh, there was a, or actually just off the reserve, but the, but the school the school was a government school, uh, but it was also the reserve school. And there had been a program on fostering entrepreneurship where a group of very well-intended people had come in from outside to teach young people entrepreneurship, skills for entrepreneurship, build your own business, and you can go on from there, build your future, economic stability, lots and lots of hope for the future. And I wondered, where was the program? I did see that the sign, the sign for that program was hanging over the school and it was probably uh, about, would you say, about five times the size of the sign of the school and there was no, no sign of a program. They'd come for several months, spent a couple of million dollars. It's a lot of money. You could do a lot, a lot of good with that amount of money. And they left. And someone who I consider my true partner, whom I've already introduced, Jennifer Brennan, was here with me that day, there with me that day, rather, and she said, she said something very insightful. After we left, I said, wow, I didn't, I didn't really see any evidence of the social entrepreneurship program. I, I wondered what happened to it. And she said, more or less, well, I'll tell you what happened to it. It failed. Take a look around. Where do you see the consumer base for all of these new entrepreneurs? Okay, why I say that's not how to do it 
There's a few lessons in that. One, it was imposed. It, was, it wasn't a government program, but it was a program from the outside. Now, I'm from the outside, too, and I really get that, so uh, I, uh, I can't change that. I see myself as a very good bridge. I do know when you go there, you listen first to the community leaders, and they know best of all what's needed, and community members and young people and elders alike. What you don't do is say, we're going to bring entrepreneurship and business to you. And by the way, don't forget to say thanks. And at the end of it, I think you can make people feel more isolated, like they failed. They had this great opportunity and they failed when what wasn't there was some kind of a coordinated approach looking at these issues as being multidimensional, as I spoke about earlier. That's how not to do it. So I would say the how to do it is to begin with what's a deep listening. What I'm, I'm still working on that, just to really learn how to, to listen actively. It's a, it's a long, it's a long, uh, it's a long process. It's amazing what you can learn. Listen to the elders, listen to the wisdom, but also think about it. If you go into someone's house for dinner, do you go in there and say? Well, you know, I'm sure you've, you've made something really nice, but um, we have something better, and uh, we're actually going to serve it tonight, and um, don't forget to say thank you. You, you kind of are going to get nowhere. No one's ever done that to me, by the way. <laughs> um, but it would feel awful if you go into someone's home and their home communities, and I, I think I've only barely skimmed the surface about what community means in indigenous communities or in L'Arche where communities that we could all learn, learn from, intergenerational communities too, you have to go in there and start with a basic, a basic level of, you will tell me what you need and learn. And by the way, I'm saying thank you. Thank you for having the trust to invite me into your home. Now, now let's, let's talk. I know it sounds basic. I'm hoping that my affiliation with ISID is going to help me a lot to learn and to grow and also to be able to have superb faculty and especially superb students to come in and talk to me and help educate me about policy because that is what it's about. But they also be, have to be policies that work and that are grounded in practicality. Okay, I'm going back to deep listening for a sec. <laughs> Thank you. I wish you all the best in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So, the last question, because we're running out of time. Hi, my name is Felix. Hi, uh, Felix. Thanks for your speech. It was really interesting. Thank you. And I think social inclusion, uh, ex exclusion is a really important topic today uh, everywhere around the world. So my question is uh, particularly about indigenous peoples. This summer, I was um, working for an NGO in South Africa that uh, represented indigenous groups around Africa. And um, what's really interesting about the uh, indi indigenous issue in Africa is not like in Canada where it's quite clear who's indigenous and who's not. In Africa it's harder to say which group is indigenous and which group is not. And therefore I was working with a lot of groups that um, lived on land for generations and generations and which we define as indigenous but that are not recognized by their governments as indigenous peoples. So my question was, um, when you talk about inclusion of uh, indigenous peoples, where do you see the role of the government? Because um, can it be something that only civil society uh, can do and individuals like us? Or does government have a specific role, first of all, in recognizing indigenous peoples, for example, or, or people that are ex excluded, mm -hmm. and that can lead to inclusion further on. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that question, and also, uh, if you're able to stick around for a few minutes after, that happens to be what, what you just hit on about indigenous peoples in, in Africa, in, in the work I've been doing, it's been southern Africa, 
uh, one of the, the, the things that, uh, that we're looking at most closely, and that's in partnership with Synergos Institute, it's represented here tonight, is what are the linkages and shared learnings between indigenous peoples in South Africa and here in Canada. And in fact, the inspiration for the, the symposium came, you know, those light, light bulb moments. Um, I was in, uh, in South Africa, quite far from Johannesburg, going to, uh, to visit a couple of communities where, where I, I was working. And I happened to see at a facility that was uh, serving uh, youth, children in particular, that it was social workers uh, were the, were, it was a group of social workers. I thought, I saw up on the wall, wait a minute, that's the First Nations medicine wheel. What's that doing here? And I said, what's that doing here? And one of the people answered to me, <laughs> this is not a joke, <laughs> it's like, dum dum, uh, answered, oh, that's from Canada. I said, no, I know that, I'm from Canada. That's the First Nations medicine wheel. I said, I know, but what's it doing here? And, uh, and she said, well, it's very important. We use this as a healing tool for our, our young people. And that's, by the way, they need to meet, they need to meet people in Canada from First Nations, indigenous people, and, and we need, we need to bring wisdom and tradition and traditional learning and healing together. So I want to take that now farther and, 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 and maybe you can help. In terms, in terms of, in terms of the differentiation about government and, and other, and other aspects of society, I'd say they're all really important. They're all really, really important. Governments, governments make policies and governments are tasked with implementing policies and honoring policies in the implementation. The problem is if you have policies that have been around for a very long time that aren't serving indigenous peoples, then what you can have is excuses made to say, well, we have to follow policy. So it's, it's not only government, but I would also say government can get in the way too. So that's important not to get in the way, but also be collaborative. And I'm, I, I don't think we can do it without governments. And governments are important. Leadership is important wherever it comes from. But I do think that the most enlightened leaders and change makers in government are those who are going to listen to what is happening at the community level by individuals within communities. Civil society is important. The private sector is important. Individual citizens are important. We're all part of this, this belonging, Sawak, Ubuntu. The, those, those are very similar philosophies. I also I also think, though, that we have to start per one of the earlier questions about, you know, we, we also need to, to start with making sure that, these, that the issues of indigenous peoples everywhere in the world are important, and not only important today or for expediency, but important to everyone, and not simply important because, and this is a good reason, but these are our first, the countries that we're living in, these are the first peoples, and there's so much we can learn, but it's also that we need to, we need to accept and understand ourselves that indigenous societies have a lot to teach us today. I think if we really get that, then whether it's, it's government or anywhere else, this isn't just about once in a while, it's about all the time, and that would be my dream. Thanks. Thanks, Felix. So, just to kind of to wrap up, I just want to pick up on one of the many provocative and interesting things that, that Kim said, and this is her point about tolerance, right? If you, if you think about it, tolerance is actually quite condescending. If it was in, obviously unambiguously good, we wouldn't need to worry about tolerating it, right? Obviously, it's better to tolerate than to be intolerant. And I think your, your three R's are going to catch on because what they do is they empower. If you have respect, 
uh, uh, recognition with reconciliation, it means you're putting people at a level playing field. You're going beyond toleration. And even if we don't know exactly, have a universal definition of indigeneity, what we do know is that indigenous people are the poorest, most discriminated, and most marginalized. So there is something there, and the only way to, to address it appropriately in the long run, at least, is through, I think, the, the three R's, moving beyond toleration to something more positive. So please join me in thanking Kim. Well, because we, we, I, we, I'm sorry, we, we just kind of ran out of time. Because he, we'll take one more, can we take one more question? Well, you're the okay. boss. <laughs> I, I'm listening. <laughs> Only for two more minutes, so I really want to milk it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, like, thank you so much for giving this speech. Uh, I saw What's it was, your name? I'm Bill. Hi, Bill. Okay, um, so, yeah. Uh, like, this summer, I worked for a museum in northern Alberta, so I lived on a native reserve. So a lot of this, and I, like, worked with, um, people were living there and I, like a lot of things you said really resonated with me. Um, so one thing I kind of come to know is that there's a sense of hopelessness, I, I guess, within like reserves that I guess the feeling that, that no one, like nothing will ever change because people know, don't know, they don't understand and they don't really care. So like how, how would you, Broadly speaking, like combat this, or yeah. well, I, I first of all, way to go with what you did. I'd love to to know more about it, where you were, and what you learned. I bet you learned a lot. I did. <laughs> I think that the issue of recognizing hopelessness and how painful and severe and debilitating it can be is akin to recognizing social isolation and how painful and debilitating it can be too. I really am going to, I'm really going to leave it, leave it there. The reason is not only because I know we're out of time, but also because I think that you just said something maybe more important than than an answer that I could give you about the how-to, because I know that the how-to, it's not going to come from me. It's going to come from indigenous communities, and, and I think that you also know that. But what you just said is even more important. You called out hopelessness. And I think that's so important. Everyone picture here, if you can, if there was a time that you didn't have hope for something. Some people don't have hope for the future let alone their future. And if you believe the situation is hopeless, whatever it is, then it will be hopeless. So I think that however we can help to infuse hope, not in a naive way, but in a way that comes out of deep listening, respect, recognition, and re reciprocity, that's an awfully good start. But we can't lift the mirror for a another person and, and, and for those of you like me that don't that don't come from an indigenous heritage, we can't lift the mirror for other, for other cultures. But we can certainly identify with the emotion and the feelings that you're talking about. And I would say that nothing is more the bottom of the well than hopelessness. So it tells me that you learned a lot this summer. And, uh, and thank you for helping to wrap this up. Thank you. So th this is only the beginning of a dialogue. Uh, Kim Samuel will be back in the future, and so look for advertisements for new future um, so, uh, ways to connect with her. Two quick announcements. One is that next semester, Marie Wilson, one of the commissioners on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, will be in residence at ISID, and so that will help push things along in the direction that, that Kim has already directed us towards. And we're also going to be hosting at ISID in February the, expert, the UN's Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples meeting here in Montreal based on uh, women's health, youth health, and young people's health for aboriginals. So for those of you who are able to stay with us, uh, we have wine and cheese as a way of thanking you and to be able to connect. It will be upstairs. In any case, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Kim, for a wonderful talk. <laughs>